There we go. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Hi there. They're having breakfast or lunch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Brunch. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so let's. I'm in the lab. You're, you're in the lab. Probably a bit. Um, probably a little, a little bit of um, noisy. Ambient noise. I hear. I hear some voices in the background, but it's not too bad. I hear yeah, you just fine. Yeah, it shouldn't be understanding, right? Well, I, yeah, exactly. Understand. And I, I don't know Electric Japanese. <laughs> I don't know Japanese, so it doesn't really distract oh. me. <laughs> All right. So, hi, I'm Audrey, and so hmm. how how do we proceed? Exactly. So I'm I'm Jerry. Um, I don't know when you want to start recording, um, and also I don't know. Uh, I assume you're going to post the recording publicly, but I don't know in what form. So I was thinking of recording on my end as well. Okay, um, probably, that's great. Probably, um, that's, probably it's a good idea anyway to just double down, right? So uh, actually, sure. And at the end of it, we can collectively decide whether it's published in a video form or edited slightly and published in a video form or skip the video form altogether and make a text to transcript and publish that instead. Uh, and usually after collaborative editing. Or we can do both. We can publish the video and the text. The modern world is far too complicated. It is. Um, so I will just turn on my recorder, sure. and then we can uh, figure out that later on. Uh, and the thing that's bringing us together is uh, I stayed with Andrew Roche mm -hmm. in um, uh, in New York recently, and we got to talking about a whole bunch of different things, some of which will show up in this conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, he mentioned you and your talk at PDF, mm -hmm. and I went and listened to the talk, and I went and did some more Googling and looking, and I thought, oh, wow, okay, you're, you're basically helping reinvent uh, civic participation and how government works and so forth in some really interesting ways. Uh, so I wanted to just have a, a getting to know you conversation. I'm, I'm happy to tell you a part about my journey, and I've been doing a lot of work on trust mm -hmm. um, that comes from our, uh, that comes from my realization in the mid '90s that I didn't like the word consumer. Mm. So that's kind of what took me down this uh, this particular journey. And uh, so we can kind of start most anywhere. I, I had one question I, I I sort of wanted to ask, but mm -hmm. maybe we should do intros first. I was interested in uh, what do you mean by optimizing for fun? Mm. Right. Um, so it's a uh, verbiage uh, that I coined uh, during 2005 uh, when I, I was uh, building this new language called Perl 6. Uh, Perl is a computer language with a very long history. It's one of the first, well, actually the first scripting language uh, used for the web. Uh, but it's been stagnating for a while, and people generally did not fund find the learning the language much fun anymore and so they went to learn Python and PHP and Ruby and whatever. <laughs> now there's nothing wrong with that of course but the Perl community itself uh, sought to reinvent itself and so um, it did a public consultation. It asked all the Perl programmers everywhere to write proposals, they call them requests for comments as um, all the internet proposals are and uh, there's hundreds of those proposals uh, arriving from the entire Perl community community for the designer Larry Wall to look at. Now they're contradictory. Uh, they, they don't make much sense together uh, for any um, like most of them are suggestions, but they uh, they don't elaborate very well on the underlying problems. Um, so there's no coherency in the design, so to speak. And so uh, Larry, as the designer, um, put up a design that solves all their problems and ends up designing the impossible to implement language, um, uh, generally considered by the programming language circles. So it went unimplemented. There were many failed attempts uh, for like four years. Um, and, and then I came along and said, you know, we, we can't do this on heroics. Um, we, we can't rely on a uh, you know super intelligent person donating their time and implement just five percent of it and then quitting because it's just too hard, right? So instead of uh, in, in a in a compiler in a language implementation, what we say we optimize, we means uh, we try to make something maximized, right? If we optimize for speed, we make a very quick language. If we optimize for memory, we have a language that doesn't take much memory and things like that. And I said, you know, we, we have to optimize for fun, meaning that we need to increase participation as our goal. And the language 
instead of being a secret thing, let's just be this excuse for us to getting to know each other, and that's the only way we can even start to get this thing done. So um, I, I decided to try several things, re really radical by that time, because it was before Git and GitHub. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, anyone who mentions the, the language Pro 6 or my implementation plugs anywhere on the Usenet, uh, anywhere on the internet, uh, and usually just just flaming, right? Just just saying, you know, it's been taking a few years. It doesn't go anywhere, right? Anyone who offers any anything much as a complaint, I offer them a commit bit, meaning that I uh, hand hand them the right access to the repository. Uh, they can do whatever to the language now, um, and so um, this this makes the IRC chatroom channel, the whole community, extremely vibrant because they're essentially people who have something um, pro provocative to say about the language at first, but they, they've been hugged um, to into this community. This is probably yeah. where you where you calls? Yeah, that, that's right. It, it's, it's my default anyway. So so then um, then it arrives, uh, these memes, right? Hugging a troll, optimizing for fun, and things like that. And so um, Larry Ward, the designer, joined the community and says, you know, the only criteria for joining the community is you want to want to be nice, uh, right? So, so if, you, if you don't want to be nice yet, we can teach you how to be nice also. Uh, and then we, we build one of the nicest community and the language eventually got implemented. That's the, the story. I love that. Thank you. Um, it's interesting because I tell the story of Wikipedia's birth now and then and back to when it was Newpedia and there was a seven layer editorial process mm -hmm. and uh, Jimmy Wales and Larry Sanger were trying to get you know, articles published and they got no place, and then they discovered wikis. And wikis have the process you're describing sort of innately because they depend on people participating, and uh, clearly the conversation can go haywire, but uh, it, it's just really interesting that there's a, a lot of what's happening depends on trust. You're handing the keys to the car to people who are yelling about the car, uh, and you're trusting that that's going to um, motivate them to come in and be helpful. Right, right. And, and we also have an um, observer during the Pro 6 community building called Clay Shirky. You probably have heard of him. Uh, a friend and, of mine. Right. And, and then he, he gave a public speech called Love Internet Style. Uh, that centers around this community called Pro um, as a Shinto temple uh, and, and something like that that attracts people and uh, shares their, their lives and so on. So that's, that's his observation of our community. Yeah. And that was the Shinto temple that was designed to be rebuilt every 400 years? <laughs> something, no, it, it, it's, it's basically just taking the, the mm, com communal space uh, in a metaphor of a shrine uh, mm -hmm. Right, but but not as a sacrifice, <laughs> but as an act of love, uh, and it also means that there's millions of people wake up this morning loving Pearl, and they love one another according to play in the context of Pearl, and they love mm -hmm. one another enough to stop what they're doing and listen to each other, to have a conversation, to answer questions, to diagnose things for each other, and sometimes even write code for each other, and so so I think he was saying this as a kind of metaphoric. Um, ide ideational uh, structure that people once identify with suddenly become better person. Uh, and I, well, he, he put it better than me, but that's the basic idea. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like this is a piece of your recipe for how to fix what's wrong with the world. And I mean, I don't, I don't think I'm going too far in saying that, right? Well, yeah. Well, that's my that's my one of the many uh, ideas in the toolkit. But yes, that's one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are the other ones? Well, um, well, there's. Well, Shuyang's smiling now. Um, the, the, well, she's, she's. You know, you know too much. She's, yeah, she's she's the, the actual digital minister. I'm just doing the talking. No, <laughs> I've been working with Aubrey for so long. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, she, she she's now she's now working on, on the, the the other part, which is uh, integrating mixed reality, virtual reality, um, and in a way that much more effectively communicates effect than the Skype uh, two dimensional screen can, and 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 I think that's really important because it's uh, assistive. It means that instead of bringing people and part of their attention to this uh, unnatural glass thing, uh, we let pe people stay in their natural habitat 
and just you know talk deliberate the, the same way as they always do but have the ambient computer in a kind of calm way uh, generally guide their attention and overlay different spaces into the same space so people can have both a, a large-scale zoom out conversation as well as a really local zoom in conversation but all the while without learning anything new they just use their body their their emotions um, their voices the same way as they do but that's for sure wow. to introduce and just um, <laughs> yeah, there's everything. It's like introducing um, a virtual space, more like a mixed reality space, what they're calling that right now, or shared, shared, shared uh, reality space, to like allowing um, almost all participants in the globe to participate on the same, um, answering the same big questions like how do we go, go together as a society, what do we want for our society to have. Um, maybe in the recent years or in the near future or in the future, maybe um, very far future that um, probably we don't even exist anymore. Um, just like having these big questions in mind and probably they will also break down into smaller questions, more practical ones, um, some controversial social issues that still left unsolved right now at this moment. Um, so we're thinking to like create a space for people to to participate um, anytime they want and um, to contribute um, to whatever degree they want. Um, more like having this very relaxing place to hang out and just they can um, try to think about, maybe start to think about um, what will be a possible promising future uh, we all want to have. And I, I hope that this will be a space not only for having conversation, and, but also for um, creating some prototypes altogether. So having like a prototype in the virtual space and probably that can be brought into a physical one, a real one in life that we can all try things out and having this like virtual ideation room we have um, over there in the cloud. So that's like a big... Um, yeah, not, not really big. I think that's like a possible vision we will have um, right now. And at this, at this point, in these two months, I'm here sitting in Tokyo, it's so one of the labs in Tokyo, and just to try to figure out if that makes sense and if that's possible, um, or what kind of technology actually we have now is possible to build a prototype and kind of having this space for everybody to, to connect it together. And if there's a any research uh, left undone about human computer interaction, meaning that like if a real person come into a virtual space, are they going to have real conversation or are we still going to just like <laughs> um, not really taking the conversation seriously because it's a virtual space? Um, there are things I think that are researched yet. Um, probably um, there will be some interesting topics to be opened up um, in these two months. But I think for, for me, I'm taking this um, very um, relaxing also sprint to to um, figuring out what are the possible visions we we would like to have and what are the possible questions we'd like to research on um, for the yeah next maybe after these two months. That sounds great. Um, it's funny because just today I happened across in Twitter. I got a pointer back to Facebook where Mark Zuckerberg is in Puerto Rico and he was sitting with somebody else they were trying to do they were trying to coordinate sort of data for rescue and apply AI but they were using the new um, Facebook tool I'm forgetting what it's called uh, where they were both avatars and they were lip syncing to what the people were saying um, but they were sitting in front of a scene in Puerto Rico of a flooded street a flooded neighborhood and I found myself wishing that the avatars were gone. I didn't want the avatars there at all. I just wanted to hear, you know, Zuckerberg and uh, and his colleague talking about this to see their faces and see their expressions. But it was an interesting glimpse of where some people think this is heading. Um, I'm wondering, uh, and also I'm I'm remembering I've been in the tech field for quite a while. So I I attended one or two of the CHI conferences, the Computer Human Interface Group of the ACM. Uh, a really long time ago, back when this was called oh. things like Computer Supported Collaborative Work, CSCW. It, it's gone through a lot of iterations before becoming social media, virtual reality, augmented mixed reality, and so forth. Um, in, in, the, in the mixed reality, are you envisioning feedback given to each participant during the event? Are you envisioning things done later? Are you envisioning things that let people see the setting as a group? I mean, there's many things you could do in that setting.
Yeah, yeah, I think there are many possible ways. One of the things I'm, I'm thinking right now is people, um, because I, we, we do know people are busy, right, in their in their everyday life, and they probably only want to participate when, when whenever they want, and they probably want to get a hint when when like, things happen. They would like to know there's a space they can go and log into to have conversation with other people uh, in the virtual space. So things like um, not really seeing the space is. Um, um, uh, synchronized uh, conversation, uh, but more uh, like uh, having, uh, you know, uh, a synchronized uh, uh, conversation uh, always uh, going on. People can uh, join uh, anytime uh, in any place. Uh, so it's like trans uh, transcends uh, time and place, uh, time and space. Uh, also. Uh, so uh, I do uh, think there's um, um, it's actually a, a spectrum we can try to find, <laughs> uh, whether we're sitting, um, having a very delicate conversation, getting everybody's attention. And probably the space is not like only one setting also. Like it could be a, a different um, settings where you can probably experience this. You can probably experience with uh, going to one booth and get more uh, uh, more overall background knowledge about a certain topic. And then you can probably go to another virtual room and just like sit and wait there for other avatars to join in and have conversation over there. So it could be both and could be many kinds of settings. And I also think the process of making um, could be interesting as well. Like instead of having, um, so I, I did reflect a lot on being a designer to, to design a space for everybody to talk, to, to have conversation inside. And it's like, I'm not playing God for, for, for this project, but I do like everybody um, to be able to, to create their own spaces, right? Because we all have our own, um, ways to communicate and we find things or ways more comfortable we can communicate with other people right so exactly. it would be really cool to to like have um for example architects or designers or space special, special designers on the team and really create space for other people as well and having them in the virtual space and requesting others um yeah, uh, about the ideas and try to get help from other people in, in that special mm -hmm. space. I love that. Um, did I send links to you guys about my brain? Mm -hmm. Do you know yes. about Jerry's brain and all that? Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's very, so, yeah, very much like that. Yeah. It, it's very interesting because one of the conclusions I have from 20 years of using this piece of mind mapping software uh, and feeling I've only got one brain, like I have one data file that has three, four, 340,000 things in it now, including you guys. Um, and one of the things I learned was that not having a way to create a collective memory has debilitated us as human beings and makes our discourse much poorer. It makes it much harder to make good decisions. It makes it much harder to remember what we agreed on last month. It makes it harder to express what we know and believe and, and all that. And I feel, I feel sometimes like I'm lonely with this belief because I feel it very deeply because of 20 years of feeding a mind map and knowing what things are and being able to share that out, sort of. Um, but it feels to me like the work you're doing would be really helpful if we had more of a collective memory, more of a shared sense-making space, whatever that looked like. If it looks like it should be excellent, if it looks like, you know, I don't know what it looks like, but I'm wondering if you agree with that premise and what you've envisioned and maybe what you're building that would feed that. Because to me, uh, our lack of memory, I call it our amnesia, makes us easy to spin and manipulate. Mm. Yeah, I, I still haven't figured out what it would look like, but but I, I've seen your brand, <laughs> and uh, it's like a nice way to to visualize um, ideas and thoughts um, in a more structured way. And there's another visual, visualization we used um, called Polis. It's, it's more from it's from the Polis P O L dot I S. It's a link. Uh -huh. And if you yeah. search on that, they are a startup from Seattle and yeah. using PCA to um, figure out um, people's comments into opinion groups. So um, that's another thing we are looking at um, right now because I think the elements we have in the police visualization um, could be more uh, in fragments in a way that people could contribute in a more light way. They don't really have to write a full article, maybe a 
for, for example, mm. Wikipedia page, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't know. Mm. but mm. like compared to your brand, it's very structured, and all the yeah. notes inside, all the elements inside, are actually um, a very holistic knowledge as well mm. already. Mm -hmm. And I think that might be difficult for collaboration um, uh, among a large group of people, uh, if I'm making uh, sense. But like policy is taking bits and parts and like using power of um, AI and try to compute opinions into groups and try to find consensus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's your think, take on that? I think this is a d deeper topic than we have the time to go into here, but I really appreciate what you've done and what you're working with. Um, and and part of what I want with like something like the brain is I wanted to preserve my own opinion and your opinion and Audrey's opinion so that we can see where do we agree, where do we disagree. And that means that we each have to be able to preserve our own perspective into the issues and the topics and you know say this is this is sort of how I believe. And in my brain I have a section I, I call my beliefs. And I, I think of it as my belief snapshot. And it explicitly says, here are the things I think are true. And it would be lovely if there were some AI that could come along and compare my beliefs to your beliefs so that yeah. we could say, okay, great. Uh, out of these 10 major issues, seven of them we already agree on. We kind of set them aside for a while. And we should you know, order a bottle of wine and focus on these couple issues as well. Right. And thank you, Audrey, Audrey, thank you for sharing your screen. This is fun. <laughs> Yeah, and, nice. and Audrey, I was I noticed also in your talk you talked about um, Sandstorm and a series of other kinds of tools. There seems to be a, the need of a, of a tool suite um, underneath discourse and underneath uh, the kinds of stuff we're talking about. And uh, you know, I think as you are, I've been on the lookout for what are those what are those tools? Uh, what is the tool suite that, that we need in order to communicate better, uh, and make decisions better together? Mm -hmm. um, what other things would you fold into that? Right. Um, well, I, I think there's tools and there's process, right? Um, for for uh, tools that we really want people to fork, we usually um, encourage open source tools, of course. But uh, for things that are part of the process that are not necessarily forked, uh, we also use some proprietary software. Um, and so uh, I think the distinction is made uh, in the sense that if the tool itself makes some kind of value judgment, it really needs to be open and transparent and open for modification because we're essentially outsourcing part of our work to it. Uh, and, uh, I mean human work to it. On the other hand, if it is purely for presentation, uh, like uh, sharing slides on SlideShare, I don't really care if it's proprietary or not because it's not going to change the message. Although it does change the user experience, but it's a lesser concern. Right? Uh, and yeah. so, um, for the presentation side, uh, we use real-time board, uh, which is this um, online post-it-ish um, collaborative thing. And it is a lot like a mind map. Actually, we do use it like a mind map. And, but, you are, yeah. Yeah, but, but with a service design uh, bent, right? We, we group things into facts and ideas and reflections and uh, responses, decisions, right? And then if you look at the um, very small gray areas uh, next to each post-it, it, they actually um, designate the ministry where it comes from. So, so this is uh, basically the ministry of um, economy saying, this is my opinion, uh, my subtree. Uh, on this, so so it is in a sense a a mix of many different mind trees into one, and then but we, what we're doing is that instead of just creating it, um, we will um, make it into a problem statement and use the standard uh, idea development way to try to go deep on one of the, the sub trees, right? So so that's. That's the basic way we're using real-time board and finally delivering on a workable prototype uh, that everybody can live with, not necessarily happy with. So that's mm -hmm. one of the process tools that we use. The other process tool that, that we use extensively is Slido. Um, and we, we use Slido in a lot of different ways, not just um, collecting people's questions. Have, have you used tools like this before? Um, I have not used Slido. Okay, right. So, so what Slido is is it is essentially uh, at the beginning of a gathering or a talk, 
um, the power imbalances in the room will by default mean that people in the room uh, doesn't really get equal seconds of uh, speech uh, of, of right. contribution. And of course, uh, using POSIT is one way, but it also greatly um, privileges uh, diversification well, and it doesn't really contribute yeah. to convergence uh, without a lot of uh, facilitation uh, work. The facilitation work is, is really messy and uh, really expensive yeah. in, in terms of time, right? So um, we, we, we are developing a lot of cheap and cheerful facilitation uh, toolkits. And one, one of them is Polis, which you already saw. And then, Shuyang, um, would you like to mute your part of the conversation a little bit? Because the background is getting pretty noisy and... Um, yeah, thank perhaps you, you can yeah. spell up when, when you have something to say. All right. Right, that's, that's great. Um, Excellent, thank you. Awesome technology. So anyway, uh, so um, <laughs> when when I go to Slido, um, it's basically something like this. And then we just ask people to enter today's uh, date. And once they enter today's date, they get into this um, space. Let me see if this universal... So it's audience interaction technology. Yeah, but, but it's not just. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Very cool. Um, just a second. Let me see if this yep. actually works. Um, mm -hmm. Single sign-on. Does that work? Oh, it does. Great. So it's you trying. can... So yes. you can see we, we run a lot of Slido talks, practically wow. yeah. one every every other day or so or more. Um, and so, yes, this is right. So um, as part of the, the talk, people will just chime in uh, with questions and uh, interjections and whatever. And what I like about this design is that first it's anonymous by default. People can mm -hmm. uh, disclose their name if they want, but they don't have to. And second, um, it allows for topical conversations. So if a lot of people press like for any particular question, I can just see them on the top, and then I'll just focus on it. And then, then, then the whole room is focused on this particular subject for a while, and then, and then mm -hmm. I archive it. And, but if I hoard the microphone for too long, the latest question uh, um, sec segment, which is at the very bottom, uh, will interject and um, let me know the real-time feedback. And all this is done without the audience having to disclose where they are at because everybody is tapping at the phone anyway. The other thing is that this takes attention away from their other phone applications. Uh, it kind of just occupies their phones, which is one of the, the most uh, difficult thing to deal with uh, in a large-scale deliberation at this moment because people get constantly distracted by their phones. And by mm -hmm. instructing everybody to, to go to this website, we essentially just took back control of the phones. And they still get the same attention fix. Uh, they still like to press, right? There's still uh, all, the, all the usual interactions that they're, they're, they're addicted to, but, but now it's something that's contributing to the conversation. And now once um, something is um, made into a topic, then we uh, use good notes. And good notes is, I think, the third piece of the proprietary technology that we use really heavily. And then uh, basically just try to use different colors for different uh, people's or groups' input and try to get a coherent whole uh, into this topic where everybody can see everybody else's mind map and finally agree on something and then we move on to the next uh, topic. So the combination of um, like physical post-it notes transcribed to real-time board from the real-time board set as the general topic, from Slido curating the topic at the moment, and from the topic at the moment going back to good notes uh, to, to facilitate this uh, verbal or nonverbal interactions into a collective mind map, and then going back to the post-it notes for the next uh, ideation phase in Double Diamonds. I think that's our current workflow um, using the, the three process technologies. So this is different from the team's day-to-day -day work, which is open source using Sandstorm and so on. But uh, the process tools, I think, is equally important. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And you don't use wikis anywhere in the process, right? Well, we use Discourse, and Discourse is kind of like a wiki. Uh, for example, Xu Yang just writes, writes down whatever she uh, feels um, important for the team to know uh, randomly on our uh, internal wiki. Uh, but everybody can see it and like it and, and also edit it because uh, we all, you know, do away with this concept of 
ownership. So, so and the edit history, just like a wiki, lets everybody know whose words is it anyway, right? So, so we just uh, without having to sign the documents like Wikipedia does, automatically um, have this. You know, you know, this sentence is yours and this sentence was mine, but it doesn't really matter at the end. It's all fused together. So, yeah, we do use right. wikis, but it's as a part of a, a working forum. It's not a, a separate space. Part of other things. Yeah, there was a product called Mixed Ink a while ago mm -hmm. that let people collaboratively create documents where you could trace you could trace the origin of every phrase uh, back mm -hmm. to who had sort of suggested it, back to who had added it mm -hmm. to the document. Mm -hmm. It was pretty interesting. Um, uh, let me rewind to a different place because I, I don't want us uh, just to talk about software and platforms, yeah. even though I, I, I could do that all day because I used to be a tech industry analyst. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in, in the Gov initiative, mm -hmm. you know, G0V. Mm -hmm. um, at, at, what, at what moment did you realize it was probably starting to work? What, what, is there, is there a, a, a thing someone said or a moment something happened where... And maybe you can give a little bit of background about about what happened because I think you started, you and, and volunteers started building out parallel pages to government websites mm -hmm. that weren't weren't doing the right thing, mm -hmm. and uh, you started providing more credible information than they were, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, well, um, it, it's actually it got there at the very beginning, and it's even before me joining the the Gov Zero collective. Uh, I joined about two months after the movement started. Uh, but their very first uh, work, which is the National Budget Visualization, uh, is already a hit. And, and I think that's, that already cemented um, the communities. Um, because at the time, the, the alternative was a 500-page uh, budget PDF anyway. Right? So, so there's mm -hmm. really no comparison. And they, they designed interaction right, right there. You can just click on any part of the um, the the budget and see the um, not just how it relates to other budget, but also zooming in. And there's a lot With of heat maps and everything, right? And there's a lot of uh, and there's also a calculation of the national debt. Uh, and mm -hmm. um, like if you input your how much tax you have paid, um, it, it shows you where it went and things like that, right? So, but but all these things are designed to be interactive. So. Um, if you click on it, you can plus it, you can minus it, you can have a conversation and so on. So, so um, it, it went really popular, and um, and everybody saw the website, uh, the URL budget.g0v.tw, and, and saw the the domain name hack. So there's, um, I think it's like a shrine, right, in the clay shirky sense, in the sense that uh, once you've seen this URL, uh, you you become aware of a parallel government's possibility. And I, I think mm -hmm. uh, it entered uh, the popular conscious, consciousness of Taiwan society uh, when Taipei City decided to, to use the same technology to publish their uh, annual budget. That was uh, in 2014 after the Occupy. There was an election at the end of the year, and uh, a lot of mayors who did not expect to be mayors just became mayors because they were occupiers. Uh, and, mm -hmm. so, and so the very next year, Taipei started participatory budgeting and then used the same Gov Zero technology to uh, visualize the Taipei City's budget. And it went hugely popular. The mainstream media loves it. So I think that's when um, it entered the popular consciousness. And also um, because uh, remember the forums uh, that uh, basically each and every single part of the budget becomes a forum. But uh, when the Taipei citizens um, start filling questions and so on, they actually saw the public servants responding to them uh, on the forum because it, it was mandated that way. Like within three mm -hmm. weeks, all the public servants needs to respond to the questions there. So it, it essentially bypassed the city council or well, complemented the city council and, and really changed the uh, um, zeitgeist of interactions possible between the uh, career public servants and the citizens. So it took maybe two and a half years, but uh, I think every step along the way, there's much more legitimacy uh, than the previous attempts just because of the, the URL, really. It's super interesting because um, instead of inert documents at the end of the process, basically the budget, the report, the PDF, the massive PDF, instead of that being the form of communication, all of a sudden the data is live and the data is sort of fractal, meaning that, that each of the issues is, is parsed out as a topic you can comment on mm -hmm. and participate in. 
Uh, it makes the entire thing kind of alive. And when pe when people inside the government show up and begin to mm -hmm. uh, engage, and it's it's interesting that the people voted in after Occupy uh, basically mandated that, right? I mean, mm -hmm. th that was the the force that tilt that tipped everything mm -hmm. uh, toward it. Yeah, that that's right. Um, and and because during the Occupy, what we we've been working on is essentially social spaces and social objects. Uh, and social objects meaning that these fragments of a budget, as you mentioned, are just shrines, right? Excuses for people to discover more people. And once you discover more people, uh, you naturally find out the things that they care about. So you also discover social objects through people. And then you discover more people and so on. So it builds a solidarity. And uh, as long as the space is safe and fun, people will want to come back and see whether there's more things to, to be discussed and so on. So, so that was the, the kind of overarching theme during the Occupy. It's during that 22 days, Anytime you return, you're bound to find a group of people talking about things you like to talk about. Uh, and I think um, everything after that is kind of a, um, I would say, uh, trying to integrate, an integration of it uh, into the, the general public sense. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, how does trust factor into all this? What, what and I'm very interested that people can participate, at least on the other part you were showing me, anonymously at first and maybe forever. Um, and it's it, it's typically difficult to have um, a decent discourse when you have a lot of anonymity going on. Um, mm -hmm. So that and other forms, how does trust factor into all, all these different aspects? Well, I mean, there's there's crowd moderation, right? Um, moderation is, is good in, in theory. Um, theory is good in moderation. Uh, exactly. But, <laughs> oh, I like that. Right. That's great. Um, so, so because of the the crowd moderation, so in in really large uh, conversations, um, the the really bad anonymous trolls doesn't really even enter the the conversation. I think that's the the thing that kept uh, things from exploding when uh, we allow massive um, anonymous conversations. Uh, for example, are there even good examples? Um, just a second. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, yeah. There's um, creating communication spaces. This is, I think, thousands of people or something. But um, so if there's even people who who ask are there bad questions. Uh, but I, I think the 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 fun thing is that because of the crowd moderation, um, it, it's you can see that the the top ones are all having like. 60 something likes and they ask about um, how is the government using digital technologies to communicate what do we do when the person who communicates with doesn't even want to listen um, and how Great questions how, how should civil uh, citizens do when civil servants become barbaric that is to say not willing to speak on the same language or, or not uh, and the latest question here is that uh, what is the worst question you have ever heard uh, from the audience, and so on, right? So, so it's a very extremely high quality um, conversation. But there's actually two hundred and thirty of them. So, so if you scroll to the very bottom, they actually don't are not worth much time to 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 work on. So, so in situations like this, I think the anonymous forces serve as a self-regulating force. You don't even need to do anything. It's, you just handle the ones that are on the top. And if I do have time, uh, I sometimes answer, make a point of answering all the questions anyway by spending mm -hmm. a couple of seconds uh, for every question that's down the line and spending minutes uh, for the things that are on the top of it. And so it also shows for people that there's a symmetry uh, of attention, which I think is the basis of trust because um, if there's no no symmetry of attention, if one part is just faking attention or or synthesizing attention, uh, so to speak, um, there really is no more authenticity. It gets like marginally less interesting if you don't get authentic responses uh, after a while, right? So so I think um, I think crowd moderation is really one way to solve the the issue, and uh, and we also make a point of allowing anonymous participation to evolve into a pseudonymous like stable ID uh, participation right. and then eventually revealing their real name and we have pretty good stories to tell about one particular person who participated in our crowd regulation process from the beginning and he was using a comic character's name and a comic character's 
avatar and and um, and it's the obviously Japanese name and everybody was just fine with that. But after being welcoming to the community, he eventually decided to show up to our face to face deliberations. And at which point, because it's an administration building, they have to uh, tell his name to the uh, to the police guarding the the front door. Mm -hmm. But but it's the pseudonym for everybody else. We we still didn't know. And once he felt welcome on a face-to-face -face basis, um, then the next deliberation, he actually showed up using his, his real name, uh, meaning that, okay, there, he's fine of being identified. But the magical thing is, it's not just he showed up with his real name, but he also went back uh, to Facebook and, and to all the social media and changed back to his real name. Um, instead of That's his avatar name, so so that that means that it has a back propagating effect. It's not just he trusts <laughs> like this that. bunch of people, but he trusts humanity more because of this bunch of people. Uh, that's the story. Uh, exactly. Should we that person? Yeah, it's uh, Cindy Ying Yi is, is like always part of our conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I I love stories like that. They really help. Um, so our it sounds like citizens are getting a sense of agency, like they're beginning to get back. I mean, why? My whole my journey for the last 20 years starts when I realized I don't like the word consumer back in the mid 90s, and one of the things I blame consumerism and consumerization of is that it removes our sense of agency. Our only job as a good consumer is to buy stuff that's on offer and it's being advertised to us. That's how we know what's on offer, including political candidates, right? Because that's that's how our electoral cycle works right now. The candidates want a lot of money from us because they're going to spend it on TV ads and other sorts of, and now on Facebook and who knows where doing whatever. Uh, but they basically, they're treating us as mere consumers, which is this very, it's not just impersonal, it's sort of an abusive relationship as opposed to what you just said about the symmetry of attention. And I think I think you also mean the symmetry of intention. Mm -hmm. That's right. Where it's mm -hmm. not just that people are paying attention, but that they have the intent of listening and maybe acting on the idea if it's a good idea. And when the conversation generates good ideas and those bubble up, then you get more confidence in the conversation. So there's all these different kind of virtual, virtuous cycles working uh, that make the thing better over time, which is, which is super fascinating to me. Um, so do you have, does the notion of, of people getting more agency or feeling more of a sense of agency resonate with what's happened here? Well, yeah. Um, I think one of the the thing that we try to do in the e petition case uh, is also worth studying. Um, the Shuyang is the Shuyang side still very noisy. Shuyang. No, uh, we don't know. We've been muted. Yeah, so, so I'm asking Shuyang that. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, it's maybe. it's better now. Maybe it's okay now, right? Yeah, it's, it's yeah. much better. They're, yeah. They're coming down. We, we would like we would like a little bit of ambient awareness. Uh, from you also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, yeah. So, so we have this e-petition platform. It's just like we the people uh, in the U.S. And before it was like a, a ghost town. People would uh, get five thousand people to counter sign, but all they get is a very bureaucratic, uh, almost um, you know, inauthentic. Uh, response from one of the ministries uh, saying, okay, we maybe have planned this, but the other things are not our uh, purview and things like that. It's explaining the problem, it's not solving the problem. Um, and it's been like that. So people gradually did not really find it a really interesting place uh, to, to, to do a petition. But once we uh, entered the cabinet, uh, we started designing this uh, form called participation officers, where we asked all the ministries to send at least one, but sometimes three uh, people uh, to join this virtual team. We're on Slack, we're, we're on real-time board, we're on Slido, we're on all those things. And so it's a cross-ministry virtual team of about 50 people now who are um, trained into this kind of conversation. And because they directly report to their CIOs, their deputy minister, and their themselves pretty senior uh, public officials anyway, um, they, they suddenly find that it is much easier now that you have social connections uh, to all the different ministries. And we handle the e-petitions now in a way that every month we vote on the things that the participation officers would like to collaborate with the civil society. And once they are voted in, there are some really difficult uh, issues. Uh, like, per, for example, Shuyang may, may be able to talk about a particular case where the south of Taiwan um, petitions for helicopters to serve as ambulances 
because their nearest large hospital is too far away, it's ninety minutes, and and people die because of it. Uh, and so mm -hmm. so and this is a really difficult case to solve. And we fly the entire crew to Hengchun to South Taiwan for a face to face deliberation to to solve that. And we also faced many other issues. It's about twenty something issues now. But uh, the the point here is that the petitioner now sees uh, the mm -hmm. government as a whole instead of just you know code text. They see um, all the ministries uh, treating them as peers, as equals, and uh, up to five uh, counter signature people can also come to those face to face deliberations and sometimes live stream, but always uh, text transcribed. So every time we do a collaboration workshop like this, which is every Friday, um, those 5,000 or more people get more agency together because they have now a shared mind map to talk about and they consider public civil servants part of them instead of they part of the government. And I think that's mm -hmm. a very uh, very different route. It means the government trusting the civil society before expecting trust from the civil society. Right? And that's really, really interesting. What can you can you remember any stories about the discussions within the government mm -hmm. to get to get to this point? Because what what you just said is is is, is gigantic and runs counter to where I think most you know governments are around the world today, they're they're very mistrustful. They they think that the people outside the gates are mostly a mad crowd. They're mm -hmm. a mob. They're not citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, the consumerization of our world has caused us to treat them as mere consumers, not mm -hmm. as whole citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, Barry Lynn, the guy who just got a lot of publicity for being booted out of the New America Foundation, mm -hmm. Barry Lynn has a whole history he can tell you of of how we shifted from treating those people as citizens to treating them as mere consumers. It's super mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, but but what what moments do you remember that that where it became clear that there was you were going to start from a gesture of trust? Um, I, I think when we did the first PO workshops, we did what hopes and fears cards. Shuyang, do you remember the first two workshops? Yeah, it was a two days. Um, um, kind of like ideation camp, just inviting all the volunteers who want to become POs and really like having them all together and thinking about what would they like to do and what would they like to think about. And the first uh, workshop was about um, the, the national travel card. Yeah. National travel card. Um, it was a controversial issue at that moment. So we decided to use that as an example topic and for everybody to really try out the process of having design thinking process in the, in the government and as a way to figure things out and, and have like an overall ideation um, workshop where, where people actually use the, uh, Audrey was talking about hopes and, be, hopes and fear card, meaning we kind of lay out some uh, maybe 20 to 30 different <laughs> pictures <laughs> about some. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so, so there's some hint you can you can try, try to relate to to the hopes and fears you could have in the government or towards to this controversial issue, and so like they put things on, um, so they put posters on the cars um, on a certain kind on, on a specific picture maybe that make them think of some different hopes and fears. And then after that, we try to gather some more stories um, around their day-to-day -day work. And, and then another round, the next phase will be to um, have them ideate um, some possible solutions uh, in an idea development cam canvas. Right, and, and I think one of the, the defining moments is that well, National Travel Card is this card that's only handed to public servants. And it's a way to compensate oh, okay. for their inability uh, to... Basically, the idea is that to encourage everyone to have at least 14 days of vacation time. But it's it's mandatory. You, you can't not take those uh, vacation time. And there's no extra payment. So uh, basically, it's a way to uh, hand out certain cash benefits uh, to encourage people to take vacations, but it's not ju just handout of cash. Uh, that would be great, but no, it's a, in the form of credit card that can only be reimbursed if you spend it on national traveling. So it's a restricted mm -hmm. form of, of uh, public servant vacation encouragement. And so that year there was a protest about uh, the group 
um, buses uh, being out of the job because the uh, tourists from China uh, declined in numbers. So uh, th it was decided at that time that the the car will be repurposed and half of it has to be spent on group travel. And it's basically restricting the freedom of uh, civil servants taking vacations a lot. And, and it's really unpopular among civil servants. Right. So we, when we got uh, the participation officers together in ID8 on it, uh, they all proposed some very creative ways to to, to solve the problem in other ways that doesn't alienate uh, the civil servants that much. But uh, two groups out of six, I think, came up with this idea of generalizing the problem, of uh, setting up an internal petition platform that's restricted to civil servants and let them pseudonymously <coughs> point out issues like this and run consultations uh, within the public service to simplify their work and also to build solidarity within the civil service. And they saw it was just a homework. It was just a what practice and exercise that uh, we're doing to try out these cards, but, but not just like three weeks after that, it become national policy because we just took it to the prime minister saying, you know, this is a good idea. Let's ratify it. Yeah. Right. So, so I, I think then, then uh, because the civil servants themselves were being seen as consumers in that particular policy, they, they, they experience the same alienation, the same uh, thing that you just described. And so it's not yeah. mobsters, it's us, right? <laughs> so so um, I think they have every right to expect the same fear, uncertainty, and doubt uh, when they propose something innovative. But when it was welcomed and even made a national policy, then they, they feel the, the idea of, you know, collaborative ideation actually working with them in the petitioner's uh, perspective. So I think afterwards they build much more empathy uh, to people who petition and building their agents because they've been there. There's nothing like seeing results that gets people to start waking up and paying attention. I mean, that's mm -hmm. maybe that's an old lesson, but, but mm -hmm. that really does help. Yeah. Uh, have, any, um, have any other countries looked at what you're doing and said, we'd like some of what they're having and come over and, and, and listen and, and taken ideas other places. I've just been in Estonia, and Estonia is quite famous for their e-government, mm -hmm. and they have a whole uh, e-government academy that's working with, I think, 65 governments around the world. Uh, but, their, but their infrastructure seems really different from what you're doing, maybe even orthogonal in some ways, mm -hmm. because they're talking about sort of open data, and uh, they have a, a platform called X-Road mm -hmm. that, that connects all the different things, you know, and so forth. I, I'm wondering what the what the international collaborations are that you're seeing. Oh, we we still <clears throat> we talk to Estonia. We are actually uh, in close contact with with our counterparts all over the world. Um, Shuyang's building a lot of um, connections to uh, to Etalab, right? In in yeah, France. In France. Um, yeah, Etalab in France, and um, we also talked to Amsterdam City Office um, in the Netherlands. <laughs> and also, I went to The Hague last month. Um, some people from New York came um, to have an overall interview, a kind of like field work session around us and interview a lot of uh, counterparts also um, in Taipei where we had this um, uh, conference called Civic Tech Fest uh, conference. It's within part of WCIT. Um, so, so it was nice to, to especially seeing some um, um, journalists actually at, at, at the conference and they're like really interviewing people and kind of build, help us building a more holistic stories and understanding where we're standing um, with other international partners right now. That's really cool. Right, so <clears throat> I think it's not just GovTech. We, we don't see ourselves as strictly working with the GovTech space, although there are um, like this, the Singapore GDS, the UK GDS, the French uh, Etal Lab, uh, 18F, and USDS are, <coughs> are broadly speaking, our counterparts, and we do talk to them. But uh, I think the the more interesting thing is is local NGOs and local uh, hacktivists and so on, who actually, because of the smaller scope and the uh, uh, relative lack of public accountability requirements are actually much easier to, to introduce this kind of systems uh, than people in the civil service. Yeah, it was interesting because uh, in your talk you started talking about Sandstorm and some of the you know local, local open web accessible distributed mm -hmm. platforms for collaboration and document creation. I mean, I'm a I'm a heavy Google Docs user, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Slack and all those kinds of things. And it's very interesting when you start thinking about how the platforms for civic engagement and participation might in fact 
B, the platforms that we use for work and for everything else. That would be, it might actually be a very useful thing to be on, on similar platforms as we do this work. Uh, then we're used to the tools. We understand how the, the, the dynamics of that conversation works. There's a lot of benefits from doing that. Right. It's in, in our natural habitat. And I think that's really what inclusion means. If it requires people to, to adapt to a completely different user experience, you, you lose maybe 90% of the people. Yeah, exactly. Um, what, what's next? What, do you want, what are your current frontiers? What are you trying to solve or fix or make better? Or Where are you headed with all this? What? Well, in Peters, everybody has a different research agenda, right? We're this anarchistic organization where I don't give commands. So, so um, there's people, there's people making films. There's people uh, doing um, um, summer interns, uh, well, autumn interns anyway, uh, in a idea of crowdsourcing young students to just look at websites and pointing out what's wrong and, and fixing it in a kind of crowdsourced way. Uh, so there's a lot of crowdsourced engagement being being done right now. Uh, I'm also the minister in charge of uh, social enterprise. So we're trying to, using this umbrella term social innovation, to kind of unite the traditional NGOs, the co-ops movement, uh, the socially conscious corporations, and the civic tech movement uh, under the same um, umbrella. So one of the experiments that we're doing is that um, we have designated a space in central Taipei dedicated to social innovation, and every Wednesday I'm there as my office hour. So all day the, the minister is there, and as long as you have some idea about social innovation, you can come to talk to me. And um, because it's a structure as an office hour, an open office hour, um, there's many different people from all walks of life uh, having very different imaginations of what social innovation and social enterprise is. But the point is that I, I'm kind of the shrine <laughs> that, that gets people into the same space and develop social connections among themselves, not with me. And I, I think mm -hmm. that's, that's the, the magnet uh, we're now taking every two weeks. Uh, I'm touring around Taiwan in all those different regional um, spaces. Also try to, to cultivate social connection between social enterprise practitioners um, out there. So that's that's me personally. Um, there's 20-something people in PDs. Everybody's doing something very different. Yeah, yeah so we get all the trust from Audrey. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's from everybody, exactly right. actually. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Um, is what what can I answer for you? Is there anything you're curious about that I could uh, that I could answer for you? Well, I was just oh, looking at your brain, and <laughs> <laughs> I love that you can say that. Yeah, and that it actually and that it actually means something, right? Right. Um, yeah. So um, so you you spend a lot of time um, thinking about animal um, intelligence, and Good point. Uh, yeah, and. And it, it, it's great because um, there's a lot of, uh, I think, overlap. Because, because I'm, I, I don't really see human as, as a privileged species on Earth anyway. Um, and a lot of the, the work uh, that I've seen is, is one-directional, meaning that we upload animals and make them more like human beings or like super-enhanced human beings or, or whatever. Yeah. But, but it's not necessarily a, a good metaphor because it also intrinsically says that there is a linear development and the human species itself is also on a, a same race track, so to speak. But I, I firmly believe that we're all on our own dimensions, we, which may project on each other, but we're all our own dimensions. And there really is no um, you know, winner or loser if everybody's on their own uh, dimensional track anyway. So yeah, I would like to, to hear a little bit about um, what, what's the the animal in intelligence link or artificial intelligence and animal intelligence link uh, in, in, in your mind? Sure. Uh, there's also, you'll find a lot of stuff about animal rights in there as well. Yes. Um, on, on the intelligence thing, the thought you're looking at is animals are more intelligent than we think mm -hmm. uh, is the name of that thought in my brain. So if anybody's looking for it. Um, and I collect stories about of animal intelligence, everything from how incre incredibly smart octopi and, par and African gray parrots and et cetera, et cetera, are. Um, where I think I'm, I think I'm fighting a general assumption that humans are the superior life form on Earth, and that humans a long, long time ago were just really, really stupid and brutal and tribal. And look at how much smarter we're getting all the time. And soon we're going to hit the singularity or something like that. 
And I actually think that humans were really, really smart a long, long time ago when we were hominins and just kind of uh, just out of whatever that boundary was between being uh, great apes and becoming humans. And the worst we could have been is how uh, a group of chimpanzees or, or, or uh, gorillas or whatever is today, which means we would have had society, we would have had caring, we would have had funerals, we would have had mourning, humor, uh, a whole series of, of things. And if you look at you know elephants, uh, they have a really rich society if you start looking. Um, it's funny, there's a very nice bridge here to another topic I wanted to cover if we had the time, which is anarchism. Mm -hmm. uh, years ago, I decided I was going to go read one of these crazy anarchist texts. So I, I found a book by Peter Kropotkin and started reading. And the first half of the book is him describing how in nature groups of animals are cooperative. And look, mm -hmm. nature is not, you know, uh, 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 red in tooth and claw, as we are led to think, it's actually incredibly collaborative and there's, there's, there's symbiosis and there's <clears throat> a whole series of things going on that we're completely unaware of because the, the principal texts that we get are so different. So part of the reason for collecting animal intelligence, I think, is a bit parallel to what you're saying, is that, is that there, there are many different forms of intelligence, which is itself even a bit of a controversial word. Um, and if we can all figure out how to collaborate and use those intelligences uh, for our common well-being, I think we'll all be better off. Uh, here also, uh, there's a bunch of science fiction writers who are really good at positing what different kinds of intelligence might look like uh, and how those things might work. And then if we bring in artificial intelligence, there's an entire tub of thinking going on right now. Uh, about when will you know AI get smarter than us, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of which seems to be pre uh, predicated on this notion that the best AI is one that looks, that an android that looks and feels like me, that thinks like me. And I'm like, wow, that's a limiting kind of thing. And we're, we're, we're actually a, a really long ways away from having that. But instead, what if we appreciated what each of these kinds of process was good at and blended them in useful ways with some kind of ethical oversight, some kind of ethical intention. And, and a big piece of the, a big missing piece of the puzzle is this ethical intent or this understanding of the implications of what we're doing. Uh, there's this really long lag period between when we implement a technology and when it has its effects on society and changes everything. Uh, uh, Jerry Mander had a, a long passage about the car in his book, In the Absence of the Sacred. And in, in, uh, in that passage, he talks about, would we have let the car go forward if we had known that we were going to pave over all our cities, pollute the air, fight wars over the raw materials for the car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like, the, we, we don't, we're, we're like a, an overgrown child who goes and does everything and changes the world and then doesn't know what it did and is like, well, I didn't do that, did I? So if we were smarter about appreciating the intelligence that's present in everything, including the wood wide web, which is how trees and mycelia and everything else cooperate to send signals across forests. Mm -hmm. If we could appreciate and blend all the different kinds of intelligence, we'd probably be much better off as humans living on, on, on earth. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll throw in one last thing there, which is I think also a long, long time ago when we were um, just becoming human, we understood how to live in community on the commons. Mm -hmm. We understood what it meant uh, mm -hmm. to live together and to take care of the place where we lived, mm -hmm. right? And we've lost that. We turned the mm -hmm. commons into natural resources. We turned everything into money. Everything has a price now, mm -hmm. which is a new phenomenon. You know, before 1700, everything didn't have a price. Mm -hmm. um, so all of this blew us apart. And the kinds of things that you're doing with your citizens and peers mm -hmm. are in really nice ways not only bringing, bringing us together, but creating some shared sense of agency, responsibility, an understanding of common intent, all those different kinds of things that I really admire. So mm -hmm. uh, that's a, a bit of a riff on, on your question, but uh, I'm happy to compare notes on all this stuff. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a... Um, my, my thought around this is uh, actually very much influenced by... Uh, by one particular philosopher, which I don't uh, completely subscribe to, but, but it's a very good uh, starting point. Um, the name is Kojin Kara Tani, um, and uh, he has um, this interesting manifesto, which I'm going to paste to the Skype here. Uh, and right, 
called four modes of exchange. He's in yeah. my brain if you search for him. Yeah. Okay. So Kojin is in your brain. That's yeah. If you if you look for him, you'll find Kojin Karatani in there. Unless I didn't, unless I put him in more than a year ago. Okay, that's great. Um. So so yeah. Then we huh. have some. Well, this is a the PDF is a kind of a abridged version of the the very kind of low winded argument that he developed. Um, so how do I search your brain? Uh, there's a search box. There's a little text box. Oh, just type uh, in. Yeah. Don't, don't use don't use carriage return. Just type in whatever phrase. Like car, type in Karatani, uh, and he should show up. Uh, the brain you're looking at is a year out of date, because the server is the brain eight, and I'm using the brain nine client. Okay. But that's our only possible fail here. I don't think. I don't think he's there. He's not showing up. Oh, then I must have seen him recently. Right. But I will go back and look at him some more. Uh, can, mm -hmm. can you just say some more about uh, Karatani's point of view here? Sure. Um, I think it's um, it's not just the, the modes of exchange, which is already a very useful schema anyway, right? Uh, but um, but the idea, which is exactly as you said, is that um, back in the nomadic um, ages, there there was already part of the human evolution and we can still see it in many animals now um, this natural anarchistic uh, synergistic way of, of living together and, and he calls it the exchange mode U which is already gone right but uh, he sees the exchange mode D uh, which is the, the anarchistic thing that we're, we're developing um, which is um, characterized by if I still remember the schema um, the mm -hmm. idea the idea is that um, there's there's the state right, which is both restricted and unequal. Uh, there is the market, which is unrestricted but unequal. Um, there is the the clan or the nation, uh, which is a larger clan anyway, uh, which is you know uh, restricted but equal. And and he says that we're we're somewhere here uh, that that says you know it's unrestricted and is also equal. And uh, hmm. the, the the main idea here is that it's actually a a regression to the repressed because human beings were animals, and when we were animals, um, we we are actually in that natural habitat because it's the the usual way to do things to to share with strangers, uh, so to speak. And it's because of the the idea beliefs ideologies of the three different uh, exchange modes, which are of course uh, respectively. Submission and protection, a commodity exchange, and a forced reciprocity uh, that kind of took over from the unlimited sharing uh, part. So uh, I think that the main point is that instead of doing something um, or learning something, um, the way to toward uh, this kind of um, anarchistic society is unlearning something and undoing something. If we keep uh, making moves, uh, based on the assumptions of the exchange mode A, B, or C, we are actually farther away uh, from this. And this is, of course, a very Taoist, very Zen Buddhism uh, kind of view. But but I think uh, it's easy to to ignore it as a a um, tenet, even if you are a practitioner of Zen or or, or Taoism, because it, it's so ingrained in our language, even uh, that there is mm -hmm. a exchange mode going on without this unlimited free exchange thing. So yeah, that, that was just uh, to echo your thoughts. Fascinating. There's a there's an essay I want to write, which is I can't figure out a snappy title for it. But basically, we're living in the in the era of co and un. Mm -hmm. We have co housing, co living, uh, un un conferencing. You know, uh, basically, lots of things are collaborative, and lots of things are about undoing the thing we had before, trying to. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of open space, which mm -hmm. is on, you know, bef comes before unconferencing is, is really about trusting the people you've invited or the people who've shown up uh, to actually uh, be smart and to contribute what they want to define their way to the conversations where they matter. Mm -hmm. So I think that's partly what you're designing here is you're, you're designing a bit of a, of a technological open space that lets people move toward where they have passion and interest and some skill. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, uh, Found that nobody actually said in, in trust we design. It's interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. right. uh, so, so, I, yeah. so in, in in a separate conversation, we can yeah. talk further if you want. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to put together something more or less like a methodology I call design from trust, mm 
Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll send you a link to a talk I did for the AIGA a couple of years ago where I explain as much as I knew then about it. And I've, I, you know, I've moved the thinking forward a bit, but uh, there, it might have some interesting things for you. So I'll, I'll make sure you see that talk. Mm -hmm. Sure. Is that the, the, the game talk? Uh, oh, yes, it is the game talk. I it is I the game talk. A, yeah, I, I, yeah, I yeah, actually, yeah, it's part of the link. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I liked your, your point of the, the, I think it was, we're designing from mistrust, and there's no methodology we can apply to correct this if we don't change the, the beginning point. I think that's the, exactly. the insight. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, we've been going for a really long time, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I really appreciate your time, but uh, I'm, is there anything you'd like to, to sort of throw into the conversation by way of uh, uh, wrapping us up a bit and uh, uh, sending us back out? Well, anything from Shu Yang. I mean, I can do this for hours, but yeah. I know. Same here. Same here. Shu Yang? Yeah, um, I learned a lot, actually, just by listening to you two talking. And, yeah, I have some, some things on my reading list to, to really look through. And But I, I probably need to go for another meeting with a lab people and really, like, show them my projects uh, around yeah. here. But I would like to send you a link also to Jerry um, about uh, the project we're doing right now. And, of course, because everything is public already, you can already check it, but I will send you some links through. Please, I would love that. Thank you very much. And, really, thank you for your time and for for sharing what you've been doing. I, I appreciate it a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks a lot. All right. So we'll just, anything else? Yeah, we'll just follow online. Yeah. That sounds great. Mm -hmm. All right. Cheers, then. Thank you very Thank much. You Cheers. Bye. Oh, and uh, we have a collective decision to make. Are, uh, are you okay oh, yes. of uh, publishing this video? I'm totally fine. Okay. Sounds Let's great. Go then. Okay. Cheers. Bye. I'd love it. Thanks, Audrey.